Welcome to the School of Travel's podcast. I'm your host, Becky Gillespie, and each week I bring you stories of how travel can truly change your life if you take the chance to get out on the road and step out of your comfort zone. My guests also share travel tips and lessons they've learned along the way, which I hope inspires you to let travel be your teacher. Hello, listeners. I hope you are having a wonderful week and that you're ready to listen to this wonderful interview with my friend, Ms. Emily Weichel, who I actually met this past November in Chiang Mai, Thailand, after we both had joined the same Facebook event page for Women in Chiang Mai. This is actually a great way to meet people while you're traveling through meetup.com or Facebook event pages because you'll find a lot of things being planned that you would never know about by just looking at TripAdvisor or a guidebook. So Emily and I met at a lunch that was all digital nomad ladies, and we then realized that we were living in the same apartment complex. So after a few weeks, I invited Emily onto the podcast. Emily has quite an incredible story because she grew up with a family that didn't really travel very much, which is similar to my background and maybe many of your backgrounds. But she found a way to make a life of travel for herself. And I'm very excited now to share Emily's story with you. Welcome to episode 14 of the School of Travels podcast. And today I am here with my neighbor, Emily Weichel. Hello, Emily. Hey, Becky. Thanks for having me. Thank you for doing this. And thank you for inviting me into your apartment. (laughs) (laughs) No problem. All right. So first of all, Emily, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I have been in Chiang Mai for about six weeks now. I'm hoping to stay for a little bit longer. Uh, I've been on the road right now since June. So it's January now. It's been about eight months. That's one reason I really want to talk to you is because I know that you just started this digital nomad journey uh, and traveling from... Where where are you from in the States? Uh, I'm from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It's about an hour outside of Philadelphia. Okay. And just for the listeners also, how old are you? I'm 26. Okay. When you told me that and you said that you were just starting this whole journey, I was excited because I wish I had started when I was 26. I know you've got to be learning things every day. Oh my gosh, I feel like my brain has doubled in size in the amount of things that I've learned in this short period of time. And I've definitely made a lot of mistakes along the way, but... In the grand scheme of things, I definitely wouldn't change anything. I uh, needed all of those experiences uh, to where I'm currently at in my travels, in my business, in my life. So, and that's from just eight months, right? So I'd love to go back and find out how you, how did you get here from where you started? So you were in Pennsylvania and how did you like, how did you first start becoming interested in travel? Uh, So I've always been interested in travel from a very young age, Um, but I, you know, graduated university like everybody else, and I got a job, and then I got another job, and I moved into the city, and I had, by all intents and purposes, I had the best situation. I was living with friends, I had plenty of friends in the city. Uh, I had a company that really took care of their employees. Which uh, city were you in? Philadelphia. Oh, Philadelphia, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but for some reason I still wasn't happy, and I had realized that what was missing in my life was the travel. I had had this dream since I was 12 that I would do this endless travel, and one day I would just kind of, I would travel around until one day I turned around and said, I think I live here now, and <laughs> move in. <laughs> say like what gave you that dream when you were 12 do you remember uh so my earliest memory of traveling outside of my hometown uh my grandma wanted big in Atlantic City she wanted to take all of us to go see the Rockettes in New York um so I'm less than 10 I think I was like five or six I was pretty young when this happened um but it's my earliest memory of like just realizing that there's a world beyond my five square miles. So, um, you know, my she got us a limo and we drove into the city and we had dinner at Carmine's. She and, did not. That is amazing. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. So my family's a lot of my family's from North Jersey, and she, uh, my grandma and my papa both grew up in the Bronx. So they were very 
comfortable with the city and things like that. New York City. Um, I, I say the city twice, <laughs> and I meant <laughs> Philadelphia and New York, so that can be a little bit confusing for everybody <laughs> listening. Right now I'm speaking about New York. And um, New York really just, it opened my eyes to, hey, there's a world out there. Uh, there's somewhere other than my hometown. There are different ways of living besides the way that I'm used to. Uh, and I, I got the bug. I got the itch. So then the second time I traveled, um, I had done, I don't know if you'd heard of People to People program. Mm -hmm. It's a student ambassador program that uh, sends kids in primary, I don't know if primary, but secondary, middle school, um, to different countries. And you can do like two week trips or three weeks trips. Um, and when I was 13, I did Sydney, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand, and Nandi, Fiji. And that was one 17 day trip. Wow, it had to be life changing. It was. And to be 13 years old and just to, even though I was with a school trip, technically, there were three chaperones um, and like 20 kids maybe. But you're still on your own. You still have to figure out how to beat jet lag as fast as possible and how to live out of a suitcase. So that was my second time kind of traveling alone. Uh, well, I obviously didn't go to New York by myself at five, but um, <laughs> but that was my first time traveling, quote unquote, alone at thirteen. Mm -hmm. um, my first time fully alone, I was eighteen. Uh, I t I was already a year. My school offered this program. My high school offered this program where you could forego your first year of your last year of high school and do college credits. Um, but still have all the privileges of being a senior in high school. So I got to go to prom, I got to walk with my class, and I was the guinea pig group for this program. So we really helped them test out the kinks. <laughs> that sounds really interesting. So you would just go back into your school for something like prom, mm -hmm. but you were... And I could still play sports. Okay. Um, so I was already ahead on credits by the time I graduated uh, high school. And I sat my parents down and I said, I'm not going to college. <laughs> Whoa, I did not know the story about you, Emily. This is okay. Yeah, I what sat my parents down. I sat my parents down and I said, I'm not ready. Uh, I found this volunteer program online and I'm, I'm going to do that for my first semester. I want to do that for a couple of months before I'm ready to go to college. And my parents said, you know, Emily, we're not saying no, but we want to talk. We want to talk it over between the two of us. And I said, hey, I'm 18 and I found my passport and I and I hit it. So you can say no. <laughs> Feel free to say no, but you can't stop me. And the look on their faces, just like. It, it gives me life to remember. <laughs> I'm going to high-five you right now. That is the sound of a high-five. Thank wow. you. Well, where was this volunteer program going to be? Because you mentioned hiding your passport. So. Yeah, so I, I laugh at this now because I was like, listen, uh, you know, whether I go or not is not, you know, up to you guys. But uh, I do want to offer you, if you want to talk about this, like my top three places that I feel like I want to go are this, this, and this. Like maybe we can, you know, I wanted them to feel involved. And um, I decided on Bogota, Colombia. Wow. Okay. As a parent, I'm going to put on a parent hat. The alarm bells just went off because I thought of all the media images of the drug war uh -huh. and everything and the kidnappings. And at that time, I'm sure, like this was before the FARC agreement. Yeah, Rebecca this was resolution. 2011. Mm. Yeah. I'm fresh out of high school, I used all the money that I got in those graduation cards, and that's what I used for my trip. That is oh. not what anybody had in mind when they put 20 bucks in a card. But <laughs> hey, have fun in Columbia. Did they write that in the card? <laughs> no, I didn't tell anybody at that point. So <laughs> wow. I've, I've always been a little weird and gutsy this way. I was going to ask you, like, where did you, where do you think you got the courage to sit your parents down like that at the age of 18? I don't know. I think, um, 
life in, in life in general, like I think confidence is a muscle. It's not a personality trait. And I had worked really hard um, internally. You know, I'd always been trying to be just the best version of myself, and I wanted to feel confident. How did you do that? Do you mind digging a little deeper? Because that could help a lot of people, um, especially at that age. I think I just was a particularly observant person. So I have two brothers, and I was growing up 90s, early 2000s. Um, and at that point in time, things were still very... Um, boys do this and girls do that, right? And since I was a girl, I felt a little isolated in that. You know, I was supposed to like pink and I was supposed to, you know, be, I don't know, Were you polite. The no, youngest? I was the middle, the middle so <laughs> that also that can be, everything. yeah, <laughs> that can, be, that in and of itself too can be very isolating, right? Because um, you feel like everything is coming around you, you know, the, the some stereotypes are there for a reason, right? I felt it in Ohio as well. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I didn't have a brother, but definitely, I mean, my mother was told after two years of secretarial school by her father, that's all the schooling a girl needs. Mm -hmm. And my mother never pursued anything further schooling-wise because of, you know, these messages were told. Right, so, right. And it's subliminal messages, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily happen all at once, you know. So anyway, um, I felt, I guess... I just had to learn how to be alone. I had to learn how to feel comfortable in who I was because I was otherwise I would just be miserable, right? Right. Um, you learn how to make your own fun. So I think that's where it really came from. And I and I observed a lot of people who I became very observant being that middle child, having everything run around you at all times. Um, and I kind of observed what it did to people to have them feel so worried about what other people thought and how that kind of ate you up inside and then kind of looking at them and saying why why do you think everybody's thinking about you right like my I had the biggest aha moment when I was like why do I think anyone cares what I do ever <laughs> that is right? such an important moment to have it feels it felt like such a light bulb in my head, right? Nobody, nobody thinks that much about you, right? So if you're concerned about your outfit or what, what is there really to be worried about, right? Yeah. Mind you, this is something, it's an ongoing process. You're never going to be fully confident. You're never going to be fully perfect. It doesn't exist. So like you said, it's a muscle and maybe if we keep training it, a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we can keep doing amazing things. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I certainly don't know everything. I try to, but striving for perfection. <laughs> no, no. Um, I'm just saying this is what works for me. So, um, and it works for me to be constantly working on that feeling of confidence, that feeling of um, owning who I am and what I want out of life. Um, and deciding to do this, to do this endless track, to actually do it, right? Because I was 12 when I dreamed this up. Um, deciding to actually do it was a huge test and a huge, I guess test is the best word. Just realizing and deciding that your life belongs to you and you can decide the lifestyle that you want to live, right? And... That is such a powerful message for it people is. to remember. Yeah, if I could, if I, if you get anything out of this podcast, I, I hope you take that home with you. I take that to your core and walk away with that because it is something that I had to really learn the hard way with people looking at me and saying, why are you doing this? Like, why would you do this to us when we're so, going to be so worried about you? Um, it's not their life. It's not their life. At the end of the day, it's your life, and you have to be proud of who you are, um, proud of where you've been, and where you have to go. And I'd say have the confidence to follow through with the decision that you made. So Absolutely. When you went to Columbia, what happened? How was it? Um, Columbia was amazing. I loved it. Uh, I was very good at Spanish by the time I left, and I'm awful at it now. But That's a muscle too, right? <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, but yeah, I was only there. For, I was there for two months, uh, and it was a really wonderful experience. Um, I stayed in an apartment with like 
10 other volunteers. So I learned, uh, you know, just a lot of different things. And I, you had to be at least 18 to be in the program. So um, I got picked on a lot. <laughs> but, you know, all in good fun, right? But it was a really great experience. It really got me flexing that travel muscle, right? That confidence muscle, that feeling like um, we're all just people and everybody lives their life differently. That doesn't make any anybody's way of life wrong. It's nice too, I think, because you had those other volunteers around you. You weren't going completely alone at 18. Right. And you, had, you got to you know, get advice from them and mm-hmm. picked on as well, but still you had like a, at least some kind of safety net around you to help you, like almost like training wheels to... Yeah, start, absolutely. Start, start, start. I, I had people to go out with. I had people to spend time with who are in the same situation as me. Uh, which is what I love about Chiang Mai uh, right now is that it's uh, such a nomad hub, right? So it's really easy to make friends um, or find the hot spots, but also avoid the hot spots if you want to. <laughs> I, 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 at the same time, I've loved meeting you. I've loved meeting all these people around us that are in the same situation. Mm-hmm. It definitely gives you even more confidence, I think. It really does. It really does. Um, but after that, it w- isn't even when I kind of... Uh, Columbia isn't when I decided to kind of live a nomadic life. I actually did go home and did end up going to college um, and did three years because of the way that my credits transferred and things like that. And I did it the way every good American does. I joined a sorority and I lived with my sisters and it was an amazing experience. But it was, you know, just a small liberal arts college and I had a great time. I have to say, like, a lot of people that aren't American who, like, they see all that college experience in America through movies, and it actually is pretty similar. It does live <laughs> up to the hype. It is, and, it, like, I, I was the same. I went to a university in Ohio, and I wasn't in a sorority, but I did so many kind of classic things on campus, and it's mm-hmm. fun. It's a it good is. time. It is. It was, and it took... I mean, those friends I take with me, I'm about to be in two weddings from Sorority Sisters, so... Oh, it's going to be fun. No. Going back to the U.S.? Yeah, yeah, and I'll just make a trip out of it. You know, it's nice to be able to live this lifestyle and be able to do that, so... Yeah. So how did you feel when you graduated from college and you were saying you started, you started working in the city of Philadelphia? Yeah. That, right? Uh, I actually first, my first job out of college was at a local bank. So I started working at, in um, Bucks County. Okay. Um, and I was living with my dad. I was living in my dad's basement. I was the cliche. <laughs> <laughs> but I did find that I was in my pajamas by 530 uh, when I got out at five because there wasn't much of a young, there weren't a lot of people that I knew in that area that were my age to spend time with. So... That got me quickly applying to jobs in the city. Um, I mean, the bank was a wonderful experience. They were going through, um, I w- worked in their marketing department and they were going through uh, a merge. So I got to be a part of a whole company rebrand and really learn uh, the ins, of, ins and outs of corporate marketing um, or like in house marketing. So that was really, it was a really fun experience. Um, and then the next job that I got was email marketing for a medical textbook publishing company in downtown Philadelphia. Um, and I loved that job. Like I said, they had amazing benefits for their employees. They were fun people to spend time with. Uh, they, they really saw me growing within the company, uh, but still there was something missing in my life and I needed I needed to get on the road. <laughs> Would you trade that experience now? Are you happy that you had those years in a corporate setting? I don't really before? believe in regrets. Um, I certainly have them, but <laughs> I don't think that I would be who I am if I didn't have those experiences because I wasn't confident enough in my abilities when I graduated to do what I'm doing now. Uh, and I. Th- I learned so much from being a part of both of those marketing departments, so definitely wouldn't go back. 
I actually I asked that in part because I feel the same. I don't think I've said this on the podcast before, mm-hmm. but for people that are listening that are really interested in a nomadic type of lifestyle for travel, I think it is really essential to spend at least two years, I'm going to say minimum, but maybe mm-hmm. more than that, in a corporate fixed environment so that you know the difference and you learn a lot of normal processes by being in those companies. Absolutely, and how uh, I've learned quickly how little the difference is between a big corporation and a small business. You, They use a lot of the same processes that I end up using in my, my business. So, Can you tell me a little about your business now that we're on that subject? Yeah, so uh, I own a marketing company called M & Co Marketing. Uh, it is uh, mindful marketing strategies for the wellness entrepreneur business. Uh, and so I create a sales funnel and a marketing strategy that is mindful towards your business identity and your target audience uh, in order to guide them through a journey that leads directly to your services and your website. I'm sure that your clients really appreciate how you can you know, help. I, I need so much help with marketing, I find. Um, Because a lot of people don't like to be that marketing salesy type of person, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you're definitely providing a benefit for these people. Absolutely. And that's uh, a big part of what I do in my business is trying to be mindful without, uh, mindful in my marketing instead of being salesy, right? We want to make sure that we're not just bringing in clients, we're bringing in the right clients and we're bringing in people who are those soulmate clients, your perfect client, your ideal person. So, When did you start your company? So uh, when I first started traveling, I was freelancing and I just redid, since I've been in Chiang Mai, I have been pivoting towards uh, the agency style. So my website actually just launched at the turn of the year and I'm very excited. Congratulations. It's a Thank big you. milestone. Thank yeah. you. So how, I guess, after you did this job in Philadelphia and you realized there was something more, when did you make? When did you take that next step? I was actually uh, having a, just a hard time in Philadelphia. I felt like I had everything that I had deemed fathomable in my life. You know, I had a job in the city. I had friends. I had an apartment. I had the freedom to be able to knew that I was my trajectory was headed up. Right, like m- my next apartment would be a studio. Right, and then it would be next. You know, finding. A husband, right? And I wasn't ready to be that settled. Uh, so that made me feel very unhappy with my life. Uh, so slowly but surely, I started trying to pinpoint what was wrong and started doing things. I started realizing that the times where I had felt most excited about life, most alive, I was facing some sort of fear. Columbia, or um, at this point in my life, I had already gone st- skydiving. Um, And I realized that inside of me, I felt an adrenaline rush when I faced a fear. So I decided to uh, jump after the fear of public speaking, just to try to change gears in my brain uh, to, I don't know, I I wasn't really sure why, I just felt like maybe this would help me feel, get out of my funk. Uh, So I started doing improv. That's why you replied to my comment about improv. Yeah, yeah. A couple of days ago. I did not know you were an improver, but good yeah. on you. Yeah, no, I did just a 101 course, a, two, a, a 1, a 1, a 102 course or something, um, just to make me feel a little bit more confident in front of a group. And it paid back in all aspects of my life. Um, I felt more confident at work, felt more confident uh, realigning what I wanted in my life. I felt more confident with the people that my family and friends uh, kind of standing up for myself or feeling, you know, empowered to, you know, not put up with any crap from guys I dated or anything. Like, it really helped me decide what was best for me and push towards that, right? Did did you ever do a show? Yeah, I did them a couple times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I haven't performed at a show yet. I keep kind of like just doing a class here, a class there. But I agree with you. Improv, I I try to not get on a soapbox about it, but it it really gives you so many different benefits across your life, like you just said. Absolutely. Um, So 
my, my teacher actually did a show about, she did a one woman show about how she got through some uh, being molested as a child. And her whole message there was that there was humor and healing. And I, I took that with me, right? Um, I was able to say, you know what, there's humor and healing. I'm not happy right now, but I'm ready to move forward. Uh, and that's when I kind of got back to what makes me me. Um, and I went back to, I had worked at the summer camp a couple of years prior, and I vol- decided to volunteer there for a week. And I started talking to people, the other counselors who traveled from abroad to be camp counselors in the States. And it kind of reminded me like, hey, you're a traveler in your heart, girl. Like you need to look into why aren't, why aren't you traveling? Like you're a traveler, that's who you are. And that's when I started in the uh, Google box hole of how do I travel and work at the same time? <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause that's, I mean, there are drawbacks to working while you're traveling, but ideally it's of course the way to keep doing it. So. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a lifestyle change. Right. And so with that mindset change of like, let me face a fear. Okay. Let me return to something that made me feel happy camp. Oh, Okay. Now let's see if we can rework my lifestyle to match who I know myself to be. That's amazing. And so how long did it take you from that camp realization moment to finally getting on the road in June? Six months? No, I think a little bit more. So it was six months when I was like, this is happening. Because that was in August. So in about February, I started being like, no, this is definitely happening, but I had a moment where I was kind of proceeding trying to learn how to do this, thinking like, am I really going to do this? Am I really going to, like, this is crazy, right? How am I going to tell people? And I was doing it secretly, right? So I <laughs> wasn't telling anybody about it because I wanted to really make sure I had my ducks in a row because I, I knew everyone was going to be like, girl, you are easy. <laughs> <laughs> So many voices outside, right, telling you things when you take, when you face your fears or take a big risk. Absolutely. And um, it's a calculated risk, right? And it's as simple as getting back on the plane to come right back home if it doesn't work. Exactly. And um, I always, I use this as a selling point for some family and friends. It's like, there's always going to be a flight to New York, right? No matter where I am in the world. So I'm really lucky with where I just happen to be from that uh, it's such a hub in New York to, I'm always going to be able to find a flight if I need to get out. So that, that's helps the peace of mind, right? What were we? Oh, so you were saying it was like in February you decided I'm really going to do this. Oh, yes. So it was February or March. It was the end of the winter in Philly, and I was walking into work, and there was uh, an ambulance outside of my work. And I didn't take it very seriously. I was like, oh my gosh, maybe somebody fainted and, uh, or something, like, oh no, I hope everybody's okay. And I went to work and went about my day, and I heard that it was this guy, George. George was the kind of guy who brought people together. He would kind of just email people in different departments and say, who wants to go get sushi today? Like, he'd, he'd really collect people and bring them to lunch or anything. And maybe, maybe I'm just projecting, but because I was in that tough place, um, I, I do wonder if he kind of noticed that and reached out to me for that reason. Um, but anyway, I was like, oh no, like it's George. I really hope he's okay. Two hours go by and, and um, somebody comes up to me and says he, he didn't make it. He had a heart attack. He had been at the company as long as I've been alive. Oh, my goodness. And uh, so the company said, everybody go home. <laughs> it's okay. You know, this is a huge loss for everyone here. Please go home. Oh. Yeah. So it was that day that I said, like, no turning back now. Life is too short not to live it the way that you've always wanted to. What an incredible reminder mm-hmm. right in front of you, but also I'm sure that George would agree with you. A hundred percent, yeah. Wow. Thank you. 
thank you for sharing that. And I can definitely see how it would inspire you to make that plan a reality. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so naturally, I just aligned it with when my, my lease was up. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, I had a wedding in June, so I had to be in Tennessee. So I went down to Tennessee first, and that's when uh, here we are. Yes, here we are. And I know that you did do some travel in Europe before you made it over to Chiang Mai. Yeah, I started in Europe uh, because I just felt like I was too old to not have been there yet. <laughs> That's a good reason. Yes, yes. And it's, it's so close to where you're from, actually. Just a, Yeah, the flight nice wasn't flight. so bad. Yeah, it's not going to Mexico. It's probably the next closest place, right, besides Canada. Right. Um, so, uh, and I started in Lisbon, so I wanted uh, to. Oh, Lisbon. Uh, I really, I really fell in love with Lisbon, and I'm still trying to, like, think. I'm trying. I'm. I want to be sure that I really love Lisbon, and I'm not just thinking because it was my first. You know, my first place in my nomadic life, right? Um, but I do really love Lisbon. I made some good friends there, and um, I haven't actually heard this debated before in a podcast. How do you feel about Lisbon versus Chiang Mai? Oh, well, the nomad scene here is bigger, obviously, because it, Chiang Mai has been a nomad hub for so long, so much longer. Um, Lisbon is a nomad hub as well for Europe. Um, I'm curious how that's going to play out for the next couple of years, because um, I know that the locals have a hard time with it. It's raising their cost of living in order to live in Lisbon. So yeah, having it been, having having it be a capital city and hmm. you know a city in its own right, it almost feels like Chiang Mai has almost where we walk around has become geared toward towards tourists. Whereas I know Lisbon won't ever be geared completely towards tourists. So right. So, but I loved it. It's a beautiful place. It Definitely, is. we'll go back. <laughs> Me too. I'm with you, girl. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. Okay, I, I gave you advance warning about this question. I'm going to ask about the packing. So now that you've been on the road for several months, what are three, as you, you, you call it, counterband or <laughs> unique items that you're going to pack even though it doesn't make sense or you just need them, you think it helps? Okay, uh, before I left, I bought a Kindle, and uh, I didn't think I'd like it because I do like the feel of an actual book. I'm addicted to my Kindle now. I've actually brought it to the bar. <laughs> it's the perfect accessory when you have to have dinner by yourself, everybody. Oh, absolutely. And the amount of books that I go through just because I eat alone. Same. It's unbelievable. Same I In my first six months, I think I went through 12 books. Oh, it's just so great because we, you know, being in different countries, it's hard to find the English language books you want. It is. So... It's, it makes everything accessible. So definitely my Kindle. Um, I actually travel with a uh, rope. It's like a little Ooh, silky. A silky rope. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry to get a little, if that's a little raunchy for this. We're okay with that on this podcast. <laughs> but um, no, I bought it in San Francisco in, the, in Chinatown um, a couple of years ago, and I'm surprised how long it's lasted me, and it, it packs pretty small, so. Yeah, it's a silky robe. It's good, because when you first said robe, I'm like the big terry cloth one that's like. No, no, it, it, it rolls up to the size of my fists if I, if I really put some work into it. <laughs> it would just be great for lounging, right? It makes you feel maybe like you're in a fancy hotel. It does, yeah. Well, I recently bought um, one of those towels that just goes on your head for after the shower, too. Oh, cute. <laughs> It, it makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, like, do not, even though you're traveling long term, like, do not deny yourselves the pleasures of home or the pleasures of, the pleasure in general. You know? Yeah, that was a huge mindset thing for me. When I first got to Chiang Mai, uh, I wasn't sure how long I wanted to stay, and I was trying to decide if it was too excessive to have a pool towel and a shower towel. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do in the end? I bought a shower towel. Good yeah. For you. <laughs> Yeah, if it's going to bring you joy. Like, have you read The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up? By no, Marie I haven't. Carlo? Yeah, it's like, if it brings you joy, keep it. Mm -hmm. so. uh, when I first left Philly, um, my lease was up and I had to get rid of a lot of my things. I ended up being able to downsize to five of those large Tupperware bins. Everything that I own, uh, it, and including, like, I, I prioritized, you know, hey, you know what? If I fail at this, I need at least a week's worth of clothes for a new job. <laughs> <laughs> I've got interview heels and stuff, like, just to make sure I can kick myself off when I get home. 
uh, you know, just prioritizing those things because you, you can't take it with you, man. What else are in those Tupperware bins? <laughs> uh, just memories, honestly. I mean, clothes, but you know, my sorority paddles. I have so many boxes in my mom's basement, but I can't tell you what's in them. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like, why have them? Exactly. Uh, I have a nice winter coat and a ski jacket. Oh, yeah, that's useful. Yeah. Especially in that area of the country. Yeah, I used to be a skier, so um, I have all of those things. Um, those expensive honestly. things we don't want to keep wanna... buying because we keep leaving it somewhere, I understand. Exactly. So it's really just those things. I mean, my degree is nicely framed, so I've got that packed up and, you know. Those kinds of things. Like, it's not anything, nothing too crazy. <laughs> well, are there any other jobs that you would find useful or that you, are there any, are there any other jobs that you found useful to do while on the road that might be beneficial for yeah. listeners? Yeah. Um, while I was freelancing, I also uh, started teaching English online. You can find plenty of programs where you can teach ESL through video chat. Uh, and I found really? that to be really helpful throughout my travels. Um, that sounds like it would be a really good launching off point. Yeah, if absolutely. If you want to do this, but you're not sure where to go first. It's definitely the easiest and the fastest way to get started, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, or I definitely recommended it to friends who, if they're just not sure where they want to go next, it, especially in a place like Chiang Mai, or if you're going to maybe South America, you can kind of live off of it while you try to decide what you really want. Are there any companies that you'd recommend listeners check out? Yeah, I worked for a VIP Kid, and I really liked it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Pretty simple. Uh, I was actually able to get my TESOL certificate through there, nice. which was pre pretty easy. Uh, I think China recently changed. So you teach students in China, um, and they recently changed their requirements for a te online teachers, if you want to do that. So that was something that um, I have another friend who does it and she just had to do it because uh, she doesn't have a degree in teaching. I don't have a degree in teaching either, but it's kind of nice to know that I have that profile up there. I've got a good set of, um, you do technically have followers on there too, right? Oh, really? So, and they get notifications when you open up slots. So God forbid anything were to happen, I do have that to fall back on, which is really nice. That is, I think, always a great, it's always good to have a plan B. Yeah, and there definitely should be, um, you know, you definitely need to have a an emergency fund and FU money, right? If something goes really bad you just and you just need to get out of there, FU fund. Like, if you're right? talking about confidence before, that definitely gives you the confidence. Absolutely. You know, an, an abundance mindset. Right, like who cares how much the Uber costs, like just get yourself out of this situation, mm -hmm. Right. Definitely. Well, of all these travels that you've done now since the age of 12, the age of three, <laughs> younger than that, yeah. uh, what, what do you think travel has taught you? Never judge someone, and uh, there are a lot of ways to live your life just because somebody doesn't live their life the way that you do, doesn't make them wrong or weird. Uh, yeah, so I think it's just the judgment thing, learning not to judge people. Uh, we're assuming that you're way of life is superior, which um, can be hard today, right? It's, it's interesting because I do think, you know, us both being from the States and from a similar part of the country, like, mm -hmm. we're told so many times growing up, or we were, I'm sure that you were told, oh, this is the best country in the world. We do things the best way. Yeah, a big one I remember being told was uh, that a degree in the States, like, hold held much more weight than a degree from somewhere else. I'm like, and a lot it's more a degree. Money. Yeah, it costs a lot more money, uh, so I don't think that's necessarily true. <laughs> and I think being told that so often when we were young, it keeps people like us staying in the U.S. or not exploring as, as far because they think, no, I'm already in the best place. But right. they never took that time to check it out and see if it was true. Exactly. We're, it's You're valuing um, just being in the States instead of... Um, being in the best place for what you want to do, right? So, like Pennsylvania was a bit is a big state to go to school for teaching or uh, nursing. I think is pretty big there. Um, so it makes sense 
to travel somewhere else, from somewhere else to, to learn that there. That wasn't necessarily the best, the supreme place to study communications. I mean, I went through a really great program, but it wasn't like the place to be for communications, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I don't love my country. There's so much I'm sure we both love about the U.S. Uh, of course. Born and raised, but I think that we're the number one mentality can really limit people. Absolutely, and it, there's no place like home, but yeah, that mentality can really, uh, it's, it's not helpful. So what advice do you have for those traveling for the first time or those who might feel too overwhelmed to travel? Uh, what helped me was uh, I made a packing list and then I cut it in half. I promise you don't need nearly as much as you think that you do and being outside of your hometown doesn't mean that there's nothing as inaccessible to you, right? I mean, Amazon ships everywhere, so <laughs> you, really, you really don't need nearly as much as you think you do. Uh, and if you're just getting started, uh, I definitely recommend uh, reading Vagabonding or the 4-Hour Workweek, of course, is the Nomad's Bible, right? <laughs> but definitely just doing your research and finding out the system that works best for you because there's a lot of advice out there, so that can feel really overwhelming, and I definitely got caught in that overwhelming feeling, like, you know, I'm getting so many different pieces of advice from so many different places. Uh, just, you got to filter it out and just start. Like the minute that you get on the road and you're actually in it, you become a lot more better at filtering those things out uh, and being able to do your own research and deciding what's best for you. So just breathe and do your own research. <laughs> great advice, great advice. And where do you want to travel to next, Emily? What is your next travel challenge, would you say? I have been dreaming about Bali. Uh, and spending maybe the rest uh, into the summer there um, but I have a wedding in November in Virginia so um, I have to head back to the States I'm thinking about spending uh, a month or two home to really celebrate that uh, so I really have to make my way on that side of the world <laughs> um, but uh, Asia for most of 2019 Nice. There's so much to explore here. Between Yeah, between Bali and Thailand, I'm sure. I'll be somewhere there. <laughs> Great. I'm sure you'll make the most of it. Yeah, I'm really excited. Well, Emily, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us today. I've learned a lot about you, too, in this conversation. <laughs> if our listeners want to find out more about you or even use m &Co for their next marketing venture, where can we find you? So you can find me at uh, M and Co Marketing. That's E M A N D C O Marketing dot com, or you can find me on Instagram at the Intrepid Emily uh, to see a little bit about my travels. And there's also some business on there too. But uh, those are definitely the top places. Or you can email me uh, at hello at M and Co Marketing dot com. So great, and we'll put those links in our description on the website. Awesome. So thank you, Emily. Great. And I'm looking forward to spending time with you this weekend at the Nomad Summit in yeah. Chiang Mai. Yeah, thank you for having me. I was so great to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope you were as inspired and amazed as I was as I was interviewing Emily with how brave she was, especially at such a young age, to just think of her own path and how she was going to take it and then eventually getting on the road full time. So, Emily, I have no doubt that you are going to succeed beyond your wildest dreams, and I wish you all the best with M & Co. Marketing. We are going to put a link on schooloftravels.com website to her marketing company if anybody is looking for some digital marketing advice. Emily has it. I'm also going to put links to some of the programs that Emily mentions, including the one she used for her middle school trip and also the company she used when she went to Columbia. Look for all the relevant links on our website, as usual. And if you're loving this podcast, you know I would love for you to subscribe, like, share with your friends. It helps to spread the word of travel and inspire others. So thank you so much. And I'm going back to my travel quote fun with one of the most prolific authors of our modern age and one of the best horror writers as well, Stephen King. He says, you can, you should, and if you're brave enough to start, you will. I love that. That could apply to so many things even beyond travel. The question is, when are you going to start, listeners? Take that trip. Start planning now. And I'll see you next week.
Thanks for listening to the School of Travels podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love for you to subscribe and leave us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. Special thanks to The Sam Chase for allowing us to use their song, In a Perfect World. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode, and remember to always let travel be your teacher. If you keep your options open, there are places you will go. They will treat you like the kings and queens your parents thought you'd be when you were born. You'd see it all with your head up standing tall, and you'd look back and think it's funny how you spent your time and money.